Jane meticulously adjusted the micro-resistors on her handheld device, her soldering iron dancing between wires and circuits with practiced ease. Her apartment was a sanctuary of both tech and survival gear, filled with the smell of solder and circuits. Why does everyone make survival seem so complicated when technology can simplify it? She paused, placing the soldering iron back into its stand and glanced at her computer screen. An open forum displayed her query, looking for HV capacitors and rare earth magnets in bulk. The top response was a surprising one. Someone mentioned that IKEA's electrical fitting section often had obscure components. An electronic scavenger hunt at IKEA, count me in. Fully aware of the unconventional choice, she shrugged. Jane needed those components, and if it meant braving the labyrinthine lanes of IKEA, so be it. She packed her essentials, a multi-tool, flashlight, and the mysterious device she had just finished assembling. Slinging her backpack over her shoulder, she headed out. The sun hung low as Jane pulled into the IKEA parking lot. Lengthening shadows from sparse cars stretched across the asphalt like long, ominous fingers. Ignoring the unsettling emptiness, she locked her car and stepped through Ikea's sliding glass doors. Everything seemed typical at first. The smell of Swedish meatballs wafted from the cafe, arrows on the floor pointed her in various directions, and the familiar layout of the living room section greeted her. With determination, Jane made her way toward the electrical fitting section. It took longer than she'd anticipated. The store seemed to go on forever, and each aisle appeared longer than the last. After 20 minutes of walking, she realized that her surroundings were beginning to change. Minimalist. Scandinavian designs were slowly giving way to more elaborate, even Baroque furnishings. The lighting seemed dimmer, the aisles narrower. Maps are supposed to simplify, not confound. Something is amiss. She pulled out a store map from a holder on the wall. The paper felt odd, almost like fabric, and the layout depicted made no sense at all. A sense of unease settled in her stomach. Deciding to backtrack, Jane turned around and retraced her steps. But nothing looked familiar anymore. Even the arrows on the floor seemed to twist and turn, directing her in bizarre, looping patterns. It hit her then. She was lost. The store had darkened considerably, and Jane now found herself in an eerily quiet section filled with children's furniture. Murals of enchanted forests and fairy tale castles adorned the walls, but in the dim light, they looked sinister. She pulled out her flashlight, but as she did, she heard it a low, guttural growl echoing through the empty aisles. Slowly turning around, her flashlight beam fell upon a figure clad in the typical IKEA staff uniform. But its face, its face was grotesquely deformed, eyes lifeless and jaw unhinged. That's no ordinary staff member. Time to implement escape protocols. As the entity lunged at her, Jane clicked the button on her handheld device, a high-frequency sound wave emitted, and the monstrous staff member paused, disoriented. Jane didn't waste a second. She ran, her flashlight cutting through the darkness as her legs carried her through an unpredictable maze of furniture sets and home appliances. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, she found a hiding spot. A wardrobe in the bedroom section. Gasping for breath, she stepped inside and shut the door. As she sat in the darkness, heart pounding, she came to a horrifying realization. She was lost in an impossibly large, infinitely dangerous IKEA store. And she was not alone. Jane spent what felt like hours in the wardrobe, listening intently for any sound that might signal the approach of another monstrous staff entity. When she finally emerged, flashlight in hand, she felt a wave of exhaustion wash over her. Is this society's reset button? 
She navigated through endless aisles of beds, couches, and tables, each step amplifying her sense of isolation. Just when despair started to weigh her down, she saw a flicker of light in the distance. Intrigued and hopeful, she quickened her pace. The sight that met her eyes was both comforting and bewildering. She had found a community of survivors, living amidst an elaborate setup in the kitchen section. A perimeter was fashioned out of counters and cabinets, and a few makeshift tents stood within the enclosed area. A central fire pit was crafted from stainless steel bowls, surrounded by assembled IKEA chairs. The smell of burning wood mixed with the scent of canned food. But as she worked on her device, Jane noticed a group of survivors huddled around Mark, who was speaking in hushed tones. From their furtive glances in her direction, it was evident that her actions were the subject of their discussion. It seems I'm teetering on the brink of exile. Finally, her device was ready. Jane approached Mark, offering it as a form of reconciliation. I've made something that might help us find a way out. Will you give it, and me, a second chance? Mark examined the device, then looked up at her. All right, but if this fails, it's not just on you. It's on me for trusting you. The tension was palpable as Jane activated her device. For a moment, nothing happened. Then the screen lit up with indecipherable equations and numerical anomalies. Is this supposed to happen? Mark asked, suspicion tinting his voice. Before Jane could answer, a series of low growls echoed through the IKA, drowning out the hum of her device. The monstrous staff entities were converging on their location, but this time there was something different about them. They moved with purpose, as though guided by some unseen force. Did my device trigger this? Have I unveiled some hidden layer of their programming or instinct? Jane looked at Mark, her expression one of despair and realization. I think we've just escalated our situation. We're no longer just survivors. We're intruders in a system that doesn't want us here. Mark's face hardened, but his eyes betrayed a glimmer of fear. Then we fight. We fight like we've never fought before, because this might just be our last chance. As the community braced for the impending onslaught, Jane couldn't shake the feeling that the very fabric of their reality was unraveling, that the coordinates Sarah had mentioned were more than just points in space. They were keys to understanding the incomprehensible. And as the first of the monstrous entities broke through their perimeter, Jane understood that their battle was no longer just for survival. It was for understanding, for a way out, for a crack of light in an ever-darkening world. The community fought with a fervor they had never shown before. Jane's makeshift weapons and the survivors' sheer willpower managed to repel the monstrous entities, albeit barely. Yo. We've emerged from this, but at what cost? As the survivors regrouped, Mark took Jane aside, his face showing a combination of relief and suspicion. We survived, but your technology, this intrusion into whatever system governs this place, it's making things worse. We were barely hanging on as it is. Jane looked down at her device, its screen still awash with incomprehensible equations and numerical anomalies. You might be right, but I can't shake the feeling that this, whatever this is, could be the key to our escape. Sarah approached the pair, her eyes wide with an urgent intensity. Jane, something's happening with your device. They hurried over and stared at the screen. The chaotic display of numbers and equations was coalescing into recognizable coordinates. Jane felt a surge of adrenaline. Are we on the cusp of a revelation? I need to follow these coordinates, she declared. Mark eyed her skeptically. That's a risk, and it's not just your life you're gambling with. I know, but it's a calculated risk. One that could offer us something we've never had before. A way out. Leaving her device with Sarah for constant monitoring, Jane set out, armed with just a flashlight and a simple map where she had jotted down the coordinates. Mark sent two trusted community members, Ethan and Lisa, to accompany her. 
As they followed the coordinates, moving deeper into the endless expanse of SCP-3008, they found themselves in a section they had never seen before. It was a playground area, but something was different, unnaturally so. The swings moved on their own, and the slides seemed to extend and retract as if breathing. We shouldn't be here, Ethan murmured, his voice tinged with an undeniable fear. He might be right, but there's no turning back now. Just then, Jane's flashlight flickered across something metallic, partially buried in the faux grass of the playground. It was a hatch. The trio looked at each other, each contemplating the potential ramifications of their next move. Finally, Jane broke the silence. I'm going in. Lifting the hatch with considerable effort, they revealed a ladder that led into an underground chamber. The walls were adorned with cryptic symbols that seemed to dance and shift as Jane shone her flashlight on them. Who are you? The voice came from a man who looked to be in his forties. He had a stern face, and his eyes held a weariness that indicated long-term residency in this twisted reality. I'm Jane, she replied cautiously. And you are? Mark, I run things here. What brings you to this place? I was looking for some electronic components. Ended up getting more than I bargained for, Jane said, a wry smile forming on her lips. Mark studied her for a moment before nodding. You're welcome to stay, but you have to contribute. We can't afford freeloaders. Jane agreed and quickly set to work. Her technological prowess became evident as she upgraded the community's meager defenses. She rigged a series of string lights, powered by salvaged batteries, to illuminate the perimeter. She also set up a rudimentary alarm system using some bells and fishing line. In a place like this, knowledge is the most valuable currency. Jane's contributions didn't go unnoticed, particularly by Mark. He watched her with a mix of admiration and skepticism, clearly conflicted about her rising influence within the community. One evening, Jane unveiled her newest invention, a frequency jamming device designed to disorient the monstrous staff entities. I think this could give us the edge we need to survive better, she explained to the small crowd that had gathered. Are you sure it will work? Mark asked, his eyes narrowed. There is only one way to find out, Jane responded her fingers lingering on the device's activation switch. Before she could press it, the community was interrupted by a collective bone-chilling groan that echoed through the cavernous store. Faces drained of color, and even Mark seemed momentarily rattled. Prepare yourselves, he commanded. They're coming. Heart pounding, Jane activated her frequency jamming device. It hummed to life, emitting a sound wave that radiated outward. They all waited, eyes wide with a mix of fear and hope. When the staff entities entered the illuminated perimeter, they hesitated. They seemed disoriented, staggering about aimlessly. The community seized the opportunity, driving them back with makeshift weapons. But just as quickly as it began, the device short-circuited, sparks flying from its core. The staff entities shook off their confusion and regrouped, their groans taking on an even more menacing tone. Can any invention save us from ourselves? Jane looked at Mark, who returned her gaze with one of grim understanding. The stakes had just been raised, and the power dynamics within the community had shifted. As the survivors braced themselves for the renewed onslaught, Jane couldn't shake the feeling that the real struggle had only just begun. The atmosphere in the survivor community was tense in the wake of the failed defense. Jane's once-celebrated technology had faltered at a critical moment, and doubts were creeping into the minds of the group. In the grand scheme, does my contribution really outweigh my failures? Mark, who had been cautiously appreciative of her skills, was now openly skeptical. Your technology almost cost us lives, Jane. We can't afford to make that gamble again. Jane clenched her fists, struggling to keep her emotions in check. I understand the risk involved, but doing nothing is a greater gamble. We can't just survive here. 
We need to find a way out. Later that evening, Jane was approached by Sarah, a quiet woman who had been part of the community long before Jane arrived. I heard you talking about finding a way out. Do you really think it's possible? Jane looked into Sarah's earnest eyes and sighed. I don't know, but I'm determined to try. Sarah hesitated, then spoke in a hushed tone. There's something you should know. People have tried to map this place, to find patterns. There's talk of coordinates hidden among the seemingly random layout of this store. Jane felt a surge of hope. Coordinates? What kind of coordinates? Sarah looked around, ensuring no one was eavesdropping. Geometric coordinates, like the store itself is a puzzle or some form of non-Euclidean space. Am I delving into the realm of speculative geometry now? Fueled by this newfound information, Jane set to work. Using the electronic components she had initially sought and some she salvaged from her failed device, she fashioned a rudimentary Geiger-Muller counter with an augmented GPS module. If there were anomalies to detect that correlated with specific coordinates, she would find them. Descending into the chamber, they found an object that defied description. A geometric anomaly complex and ever-changing, as if it existed in more dimensions than they could perceive. It was both beautiful and terrifying. Jane felt an impulse, an almost magnetic pull, urging her to interact with the anomaly. This could be the end or the beginning of everything. With a trembling hand, she reached out and touched it. A shockwave emanated from the point of contact, and suddenly, her mind was flooded with insights, understanding flooding in like a torrent. She saw the store from above, its layout making sense for the first time. But more critically, she saw doorways, portals that led out of SCP-3008. We're not trapped. We're just lost. And now, I've found the way. Returning to the community, Jane was greeted with a mix of awe and apprehension. Even Mark seemed unsure of how to react. I know the way out, Jane announced, her voice resolute. And it's not just one way, there are many. This store, it's not a prison. It's a nexus of realities, and I can navigate it now. The community erupted in a cacophony of emotions. Relief, disbelief, hope, and skepticism all mingled in the air. Mark stepped forward, locking eyes with Jane. I hope for all our sakes that you're right. Because if you're wrong, this isn't just another failure. It's our doom. But Jane felt a calm assurance she had never felt before. I'm not wrong. Pack your bags, everyone. We're going home. Packing was a surreal experience for the community. The concept of home had been so nebulous, so abstract, that the physical act of preparing to leave SCP-3008 felt almost sacrilegious. The air was thick with a mix of excitement and trepidation. Could it really be this simple? Can knowledge truly set us free? Jane couldn't shake her newfound insight, the staggering clarity with which she now perceived their existential prison. Yet, as she looked around at the assembled survivors, she realized that not everyone would choose to follow her. Mark approached, his eyes searching hers. You're sure about this? Jane nodded, her gaze unwavering. As sure as I've ever been about anything. Leading the community toward the coordinates she had mapped in her mind, Jane felt a combination of elation and dread. They arrived at what seemed like an innocuous point in the store, indistinguishable from the thousands of others they had passed over the months or years. This is it, she announced. But there's nothing here, Mark said, the skepticism returning to his voice. Jane walked up to a seemingly ordinary section of wall between a bookshelf and a kitchen set. She placed her hand flat against it. For a moment, nothing happened. Then, as if responding to her touch, 
the walls shimmered and dissolved, revealing a portal. The community gasped in collective awe. Jane turned to them, her eyes shining with emotion. This is your choice. I can't make it for you. I can only show you the door. Sarah was the first to step forward, her face a mask of determination and gratitude. One by one, others followed, some casting hesitant glances back at the familiar yet oppressive surroundings of SCP-3008. Mark stood still, his eyes meeting Jane's. What about you? Jane felt a pang of sadness. I have to stay, at least for a while. There are others out there, lost and unaware that escape is even possible. I have to guide them. Mark nodded, his eyes reflecting a complex interplay of relief and regret. Then this is goodbye, at least for now. He stepped through the portal, turning back for a final glance at Jane before the shimmering gateway closed behind him. Perhaps we'll meet again in another life, another reality. Jane returned to the core of the survivor community, those who had chosen to stay behind for various reasons. They greeted her with a mixture of awe and expectation. So what now? One of them asked. Now, Jane said, her voice tinged with a newfound wisdom. We go on living, but with purpose. We become not just survivors, but guides. This place is not our destiny. It's a waypoint on a much larger journey. And as she spoke, it became clear that while their surroundings hadn't changed, something fundamental had shifted. They were no longer defined by SCP-3008. Rather, they had begun to define it, bending its enigmatic, non-Euclidean reality to the most powerful force of all, human will. <laughs>